Okay. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. So welcome to the recitation eight. Uh, the plan for today is that I will go through the concepts of attention and transformer network. And the Brad, uh, Brad will go over the code. And okay, so let's just get started. Uh, record in homework three part two. We have uh, the task is to generate a sequence uh, full name sequences from the speech frame sequence. And uh, although it does not have a one-to-one -one time uh, synchrony, uh, it does have some order correspondence. So uh, each output corresponds to a small segment of the input sequence. However, uh, there are other tasks that do not have the, do not, do not have the order synchronous. For example, uh, there are machine translations. You give a text input and uh, you will get a machine translate of the that text. And you can see here, uh, I like dogs more than, oh, sorry. I like cats more than dogs. And uh, the like, the verb like is going to be the last word of the uh, in the translated text. And uh, the docs, which is the last, last word of the original input will be the third, will be the third uh, char character in the output. So, uh, so the order will get a little bit out of synchronous. And uh, also we can generate a caption describing the image and the, the order definitely not according to the pixels of the images. So uh, we got kind of tasks that is not uh, order synchronous. Therefore, uh, we need kind of a generative architecture for us so, uh, so that the output can know all about can have uh, information of all the input uh, when it starts to generate its output. Okay, so this is a, a very general model of our generative architecture. So it consists of an encoder and a decoder. Uh, the output sequence will only be generated by the decoder when it gets all the embedding state from the encoder. So when you pass the input, it will first go through encoder and get, a, get an obstruction or some embedding called a internal state. And then you will pass the internal state to the decoder and then it will generate output uh, one at a time uh, based on that. So that's a generative architecture. So, okay, so in mass, basically, okay, uh, the decoder is essentially a conditional generator, which generates a label given the input sequences. So in other words, the decoder has access to some kind of encoding of the entire input sequence and all the past dates of the decoder. Uh, basically what it means is it had access to X1 to XT, which is all the input it has and Y1 to Y T minus one, which is all the previous decoder states, and it will use it to generate YT, which is uh, the current uh, sequence uh, output at the decoder. So recall, we have the many-to-many -many architecture in homework three part two. So we have a uh, so in homework three part two, we have uh, 
who have used this kind of structure to generate one, st one hidden state at a time step. So we have time step H1 to Hn uh, for every state time step. And we will use this hidden states for some downstream tasks. Uh, theoretically, since it's a RN network, every hidden states should contain information about all its previous histories until that time. So if we, so uh, ideally, the last hidden state is an encoding of the entire input sequence. So if we, uh, so if we uh, get to the HN, ideally it will be a good obstruction of all the input from time step from x0 to xn. So let's just consider uh, that as our uh, encoders embedding first. Okay, uh, so we have several uh, methods to inform the decode about the input encoding. Uh, so basically, we can just uh, pass the encoding at the very beginning of the time step as the decoder. But it doesn't work because if we just uh, give the decoder once, it will, uh, soon, it will soon vanish because of uh, the vanishing gradient. So we, we had to feed, feed it in every time step in the decoder. So here is our uh, first prototype. So we produce an encoding of the entire input. So from x0 to xn, that's all the inputs. And we got uh, RN-like encoding so that we get uh, embedding of the input. And then we repeatedly pass the encoding to the decoding network, uh, which is the decoder. So along with the uh, input and the embedding, so that we will uh, produce the output with that. So uh, it, it, there exists some problems with this solution. So we are relying on the fixed vector to encode the entire sequence and hoping that the last hidden state could compress all the information. But it's not very ideal because it's hard to train input encoding vector is overloaded with information and earlier inputs tend to get forgotten. Uh, and How large is the typical encoding vector? Is it like, how big uh, are, is the output for the encoding? Sorry, could you repeat your question? How large is a, a typical out encoding vector. You're saying it's hard because the encoding vector is overloaded with information. So is this- Oh, oh yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so I remember there is, a, so because we are, for example, in our machine translation, uh, in our machine translation task, it will be easy to train and use our, uh, so use this mechanism to train if the sentence is very short. It's, it's not too short, but it's like uh, between a very short and very long and the accuracy will be good. And if it's sentence get very long, for example, if it's larger than 10, maybe uh, 10 characters, it will, the performance will just drop uh, using this mechanism because uh, the previous uh, encoding uh, will be forgotten and it's, it is very hard to preserve. Okay, so uh, so that's the problem of relying on the last hidden state to compress all the information. And uh, it's hard for the decoder to focus because 
as we can see, each time we are passing the decoder uh, exactly the same uh, embedding. So uh, we are going to address this problem by pass a more flexible input encoding at every time step. Uh, in other words, uh, we are not just going to pass a fixed uh, encoding to every uh, time step at the decoder. We will let the decoder uh, determine uh, what it needs. So, it's, so we need to develop a mechanism to give it more flexible. So it will determine by the current decoder state, the hidden state of the decoder. Okay, so, uh, so here's our intuition. At each time step, the decoder focuses on a very specific segment of the input sequence to produce the current output. So to do that, we have <clears throat> we have to compute a time varying input encoding that focuses on part of the input that matters to the current time step in output. So which means it should be dependent on the decoder's current hidden state at the current time step. And it should depend on the encoder's hidden state at, the, at each input time step as well. So uh, here is our general attention mechanism. And uh, we can see we are using the, uh, so we will construct a query, QI, from the decoder hidden state. So HI of decode is the hidden state of the decoder at, uh, at time stamp I. And uh, we also, we can uh, construct a key Ki, oh, sorry, Kj from the encoder state. So uh, just to clarify, we're using J to represent the time step of the encoder and use I to represent the time step at the decoder. So we have the encoder state, Hj of the encoder. So uh, if we have QI and K, KJ, we can calculate a tension score based on the matrix we choose. So we get uh, a tension of QJ and K, QI and KJ. So what does the attention score mean? It, it tells us how much at output timestamp I the decoder should focus on the J's input item, which means this is a weight function uh, to put on the original value. So the value is also comes from the hidden state of the encoder. So we can calculate the value. And uh, in the end, to calculate so this is for, for every time step at the decoder's state. We will calculate this. We will use this formula to calculate for all the input states. So, uh, so for every, for every uh, decoder state, QI, Oh, sorry, uh, I, we will sum up from the, we will sum up all the uh, encoder states from uh, J from one to T. And we, we calculate every uh, input time step and uh, uh, calculate their attention based on the query and the key and then apply and times the value at that time, time step. 
so that for every qi and j so for every qi we will uh, get a value and that that is the corresponding uh, attention so that's uh, basically the general idea of the attention attention mechanism okay uh, so I know it's a bit of uh, abstract uh, we can look at some examples so for example here is a dot product attention and uh, we can see the query the qi can just directly from the uh, hidden state it can just equals to the hidden state without any manipulations so here we have a query qi is equals to hidden state hi of the decoding state so this is the query and the key kj is directly from the input hidden state and here the value vj is also uh, directly from the input hidden state and the attention score is uh, just by applying the soft max of qi and the kj qi time, times kj so that's the uh, uh, attention score so this is the simplest uh, calculation and it does not introduce new parameters let's look at another attention called bilinear attention and uh, basically the query and the key and the value are all the same but it introduces the w which is another weight matrix and we are going to uh, train the w here the w is like a hyperparameter we introduced so here is a new parameters we are going to train and the idea is very similar we calculate the attention for every qi and kj so over all the j's for each i and uh, oh did we talk about okay so channel dot product by linear and additive attention is just another variation the query and key j that bj are all the same but they have different attention score uh, formula so it introduces the different weights for q and w and for uh, there's another w outside of the uh, 10h calculation and basically it introduces three w's and uh, the other parts are, are all the same so we are uh, and uh, there is another variation called a scaled dot product attention this is used in the in the transformer network we are going to introduce later and uh, basically it introduces a new way to manipulate the QJ, uh, sorry, QI, KJ, and VJ. So it has for every the for every hidden state, it has a MLP layer to train. So it involves another training of the neural network. So when we have the HI that a decryption or oh, decoding sorry so for uh, the decoding hidden state we have to pass it through a MLP layer and then we are going to train this MLP layer later and for a similar idea we are going to use the MLP layer to get the KJ and the VJ and then uh, we time the QI and KJ and get a, uh, and then uh, use this square root of h 
to do the uh, scale and then pass it through the soft max uh, to calculate the attention between QI and the KJ. Yeah, so yeah, basically that's uh, all the variations of the attention. So in this way, we can for every uh, time step at the decoder step, we will get uh, its uh, unique, it will get a unique uh, encoding of the input, which is just uh, what it want to look like by the technique of the using of attention mechanism. So it will just look at the part of the uh, input encodings instead, instead of uh, looking at all the part of the embedding of the inputs. Okay, so that's basically how the attention works. Okay. So uh, now we have made use of attention to allow the decoder to selectively look at the input abstraction using, using attention. But we noticed that there are still some limitations of the RN structure itself. Uh, basically, RN structure make it very impossible to fully parallelize because as we can see, uh, RN is a step-by-step -step computation and uh, the the future result relies on the output of the previous time step. So we cannot leverage the parallelism of the GPUs. And they also struggle with long-term dependencies. So uh, as we talked about LSTM, which proved to uh, be very useful in preserving the information, but it still cannot hold information across very long sequences. So for example, if we have a, a paragraph and the previous, uh, maybe the previous sentence, they'll have the, have influence to the very uh, later sentences. Uh, so in that case, we cannot uh, preserve a relationship at uh, such a long, long term. And in NLP tests, the same word may have very different meanings based on the context. So if we don't know about the context, if we cannot remember what happens like a few sentences earlier, we cannot uh, do the job correctly. So that's why we need another uh, architecture. So here comes the uh, transformer nets. So this is a revolutionary sequence to sequence architecture from Google uh, like three years ago. And uh, basically it, it just uh, get rid of the RN structure, but use purely using attention to capture the dependencies across the sequences. So this allows the encoder and decoder to see the entire sequence at once. So for example, instead of uh, do, so as you can see our decoder and uh, encoder are all becomes the multi-head attention right now. And uh, yeah, so they are all becomes attention and they they can uh, get all the information at once instead of uh, one time step at a time. So it, uh, pro it gives a lot of uh, parallelism so that we can train much faster. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so before that, so before we are uh, going to understand the, oops, the transformer nets, uh, we need to know that the attention 
mechanism in the transformer is interpreted as a way of computing the relevance of a set of values based on the key and the queries. So traditionally, the attention weights were the relevance of the encoder's hidden states in processing the decoder state and were calculated based on the encoder hidden state and the decoder states. It's like, uh, so originally it just uh, uh, some relevance about the, by looking at some uh, encoder hidden states and uh, decoder hidden states, we can use the encoder hidden states to get uh, generate keys and uh, and use the decoder states to generate queries, so that uh, so that we can uh, get some relevance and uh, selectively uh, pick the values uh, from the encoding embedding. But uh, so now we have to change change the perspective. Well, if we if we see the keys, values, and queries, uh, could be anything instead of just the hidden states. So in this actual, so in this architecture, uh, we will discuss later the encoding. Okay, let's just uh, move forward here. So, uh, as you can see now the encoder and the decoder becomes the multi-head attention. So what is multi-head attention? The idea of multi-head attention is that if we only compute a single attention, remember, uh, so now the attention's definition is the, a way of computing relevance of values based on some keys and queries. So back to the example of our machine translation, we want to know about the, <clears throat> so we want to know about the relevance of some input data. And uh, maybe we can uh, for example, in the, in that case, I love, I like cats more than dogs. So there is a pattern seems comparing dogs and cats. So that if this is the relationship that uh, uh, attention can capture, but we also want to capture more patterns, right? So for each attention, we will, we will call it a hat and the multi-head attention is basically you cal calculate multiple uh, multiple attentions using a very uh, diverse matrix. So, <clears throat> uh, we just compute multiple attention weights and the sum them together, you can see here, we concat uh, every attention. So if we have uh, three attention layers, maybe we need more, but if we have three, we will calculate it uh, and capture different relationships. And then we concat them together and go through a linear layer so that it will be a multi-head uh, attention. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. So you've shown uh, different, like maybe four or five different attention um, yes. styles or mechanisms. For, yeah. the, for the homework that we'll have coming up where I'm assuming we'll have to use attention, like do you recommend starting out with the simplest one and then building up to something like this? Will something like this actually benefit the, the task that we might have to use attention for? Oh, I think or is this uh, just, just overkill. Uh, no, I think. Uh, so it yeah, will, has, the kind of attention you uh, you you will be using in the homework will already be given to you. Uh, you won't be needing to exper uh, experiment with different attention techniques in the homework. 
for, for okay. the part two as well? Yeah, uh, I'm talking about part two only. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. So these are so, just uh, to, to show us the different uh, techniques that are available. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so basically, uh, we are showing the variations just to give you an idea, a more detailed idea of the attention, what attention is. Do you know That's, which one yeah. will be for the, which one we'll actually be using for the homework? Oh, I'm, I forget. I can uh, say. I, I think it's a dot product attention, uh, but I'm going to have to double check that. But uh, it's basically, uh, you'll be using keys, values, and queries, but uh, yeah, basically the formulation will be given to you and uh, you won't need to experiment with that or, or try to determine which one you want to use. Uh, we don't know right now, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, let's wrap up. So the idea of multi-head attention is just a concatenate of different uh, attentions. So we use the scale dot product attention metrics and then we uh, compute different uh, dependencies and we can cut them together. So that's it. Okay, so the transformer encoder. So let's look at the encoder part. The encoder part uh, contains uh, a block like this. So because it's not RNN anymore, so we need a positional encoding to let it know uh, which position it is. And uh, we, so the inputs is be extracted as input embeddings and then uh, XR with the positional encoding so that we know about its position. And then we go through this multi-head attention. So in this case, the value key and the va key value queries are all itself as well be mentioned in lecture as well, it's called self-attention. And this is a multi-head attention. So when, after we go through the multi-head attention, we will have a skip shortcut. So we have a skip network here. So add them together and the normalization. And then we will pass it to a feed forward network which is just uh, containing several linear layers maybe and uh, add and we get a skip uh, network shortcut as well. So we add them and the normalization. So yeah, we, we repeat this, uh, this block for uh, n times. I think it's like around six blocks in the, in the original paper and uh, so residual connections between multi-head attention blocks, positional encoding, and this encodings are then added to the input. Yeah, this is basically describing how we add the skip connections. And uh, this is to explain why we need the positional encoding without them. Uh, like I like 11785 more than 1070 seven, it will be identical to this. If we do, do not know about the, the position. So yeah, so that's just the encoder. It has a self attention of a, a multi head attention and uh, a skip connection and a feed forward network and a skip connection. And so this is a basic block. And uh, if we're going to look at the decoder, so it's very similar. If we just look at the, the top part, it's very similar to uh, what the encoder is. But uh, here is the difference. So, uh, so here there is a masked multi-head attention, which is a which is the attention, self-attention of the output embedding. So the output embedding is uh, in our uh, machine learning, oh, sorry, machine translation co uh, example, that is our uh, expected translated Japanese characters or Japanese sentence. 
and uh, we are going to uh, use the mask multi-head attention to block the future outputs values during training. Otherwise, we will just know because every time the every time the decoder knows uh, for all the embeddings of the output, so it can just use the use a word. If we do not block it, it will just use the next word in the embedding. So it's kind of like cheating and it does not uh, learning, but it always always returns the correct lab, uh, the correct character. So this is not what we want. So we want to uh, use the mask multi head to do the self attention so that we do not uh, do not uh, read the future predictions. And uh, the other part is all about the same. So basically, we use the uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, the decoder here use the encoders outputs here. So this line is the encoders outputs and it will go through a multi-head attention. It will use that for its key and values. And uh, the query is from, so this is its query, is from the output embedding after the self attention, it will become the query and then for this block. And then it will go through a so it will add to the skip connection and do the normalization. And here goes through a feed forward network and skip, skip connection as well. And uh, finally, it will go through a linear layer and the uh, soft max, and it will output the probabilities for every character at that time. Okay, cool. So that's the decoder. Uh, if we going to put it together, it will look like this. Uh, it looks very uh, prohibitive, but it's actually just, uh, if you understand the multi-head attention, and uh, basically you just use several multi-head attentions and uh, use a mask technique here. And uh, yeah, basically that's how the model works. The input sequence is used to compute the keys and values in the encoder. So the keys and values will be computed here and keys and values and will be passed to the decoder. And the mask attention, mask attention blocks the decoder transforms output sequence until the current time step. So it will only every time in the process, the output, it will only get uh, every uh, time steps before the current time steps based on the mask multi-head attention. It will ignore all the future, future uh, sequences in the output embedding. And uh, it will use multi-head attention in the decoder and combining the keys, queries, and values, the values is generated here. And it will pass through this attention, the mock head attention, and combine with uh, the original values, and then go through a feed forward network. Yeah, so that's uh, how it looks like by putting the four together. Mm, do we have some problems? Uh, Jigwe, we might want to keep the questions till the end. Uh, we might run out of time. I need some time to okay. explain the code. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> so let's see a uh, demo now. Okay. Uh, can you uh, see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, first of all, to answer your question, I checked uh, in homework four, you'll be using dot product attention. That's like the default one, but uh, you're also encouraged to experiment with other techniques if you want. But yeah, basic uh, dot product attention should work. 
Okay, so in this code demo, uh, we'll be discussing a toy example to uh, try to predict basically the uh, pronunciation tags uh, for English spellings. Uh, this task is the same as the last recitation. So we'll be uh, using an encoder decoder uh, uh, model here, uh, which is basically first we'll apply the encoder on top of the spellings. So let's take an example. If you have C, then we'll apply the encoder on top of it. We'll get an intermediate representation. Once we have that, then we'll uh, try to derive a attention vector from it, which basically will tell the model how important S is, how important E is, and how important E is. It will try to contain that information. So that's one information we'll try to get from the uh, intermediate representation. And the second is the intermediate representation itself. Then we'll take these two data points and we'll try to use them to uh, try to predict the uh, phoneme labels at every timestamp. And notice that the length of this has got nothing to do with the length of this. So this space is just a separator. Uh, uh, that's not actually a prediction. And uh, let's see. So uh, yeah, like Jingwei mentioned, uh, one thing that's important here is like, unlike previous, uh, your previous tasks, you were required to, in the previous task, you were required to make a prediction at every timestamp. But here we are first get, we are uh, processing the entire input data we're getting an intermediate representation and then we are using that and the attention vector to try to make predictions at every time step for the phonemes. So this is what our data looks like. Uh, as you can see, the batch, uh, batch size is just 12 here, uh, 12 data points. And this is the input and this is the expected output. And uh, this is the vocabulary size. Only five letters are allowed uh, uh, for the input data. And this is the vocabulary for the uh, output output predictions. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a S tag here, which is basically which basically denotes the beginning of the sequence, and the slashes tag denotes the end of the sequence. Okay, so let's do some pre-processing first, uh, and then we'll uh, jump into the model architecture. Uh, so what we are doing basically, first of all, we need to convert the data into tensors. So we'll uh, go through all the data. And for each element, let's say this one, uh, we'll, we'll find the position of the letter in the vocabulary. So position of S will be three, position of E will be zero. So that's how we'll uh, uh, put numbers in a tensor that we're creating for the input data. So finally, once X is constructed, uh, let me show you what X looks like actually. So this is what X looks like. As you can see, the, the input C has been converted into 300, 304. Uh, 304 is basically the next one set and so on. And uh, that's your X. And similarly, you have your Y for phonemes that those will also be converted to tensors. But remember that this is a list of tensors. This entire thing is not a tensor yet. And it cannot be a tensor because you have variable lengths for every element. So you, you need to fix that problem before uh, you need to convert it into a tensor because uh, as you guys should know by now, uh, a tensor cannot have dynamic lengths for any given dimension. Okay, so uh, we are also storing the lengths of uh, the original lengths of uh, X and Y. So for example, as you can see here, C is of length three and site is of length four. So we wanna preserve that information. We'll use that later. And uh, what else? Yeah, then we call pad sequence on top of X, uh, which basically solves this problem that I was mentioning. Uh, it will basically pad uh, each element in this list so that the uh, final output is a two dimensional matrix, two dimensional tensor, and that looks like this. So try to compare this selected uh, row with this. You can see that 300 got actually converted to 3000. This extra zero is the padding. Similarly, 304 is now 3040. And maybe let's take a bigger one, like 4002, here is 4002. Okay, so that problem is solved now. The, the same thing we do for Y as well. So now our uh, input data is ready. Now let's talk about encoder. So encoder, like I said, basically will take as input what? Take as input the tensor representation of C and will produce an intermediate uh, vector representation that stores all the information in C. 
So uh, in this toy example, our focus is to teach you how to code and code a decoder and the focus is not to produce a very accurate model. So, which is why the results will also not be that great for this toy example, but yeah, you'll get the basic idea. So that's why this is a very simple architecture. So as you can see, there's an embedding layer. What is an embedding layer? Suppose your vocabulary size is 10. So what you want is if you give this embedding layer an, in, an input of let's say two comma three comma five. So you are saying that, okay, take the second letter, take the third letter, take the fifth letter. So for each of these letters, it will produce an embedding vector. So the input is vocab size and the output is embedding size. So uh, suppose you get an X here, which is uh, max length comma batch size. So uh, since we're gonna be dealing with LSTMs here uh, and uh, 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 as you might've used in the previous homework as well, uh, the batch size dimension is second. So make sure you're aware of that. And uh, okay, so you have X, which is batch size comma max length. This max length is four for X, as you can see here, three, zero, zero, zero. This is the max limb. And this dimension is the batch size, which is 12. So you have your uh, input parameter. You'll pass it through the embedding layer. So after this is passed through this layer, this max limb comma batch size will become max limb comma batch size comma embedding size. So for each of the letter, it will produce an embedding vector. Once you have that, then you call pack padded sequence. So I think this has also been covered in the last recitation. Uh, basically what you're trying to do is uh, you're trying to make your uh, code more efficient efficient by uh, by making sure that the LSTM doesn't make predictions on the padded uh, tokens. So basically if you look here, uh, this zero, right, that I told you about, this three is important, zero is important, zero is important, but this zero is just padded value. So you don't want to waste your time making predictions on this. So that's why you pack a padded sequence. So where is the padded sequence coming from? From this line, when we did pack sequence. So we want to pack that sequence and then we'll pass it through the LSTM. And as we all know, it will uh, give out two outputs. The first one is the output itself. And the second one is a tuple final state, which is your hidden and uh, C vector. So why we, are get, why we are getting this instead of just ignoring this? Because uh, we'll be using this as the initial uh, state in the decoder. So let's uh, not worry about this now. Let's just save it for now. And uh, what else? So you'll uh, get the embedding vector, uh, embedding, uh, yeah, embedding uh, vector for X, and then you'll pass it through the pack padded sequence. You have made it more optimal, then you pass it through the LSTM, then you get the output, and then you again call pad pack sequence. So basically, take the pad sequence and convert it back to a padded sequence. So because we want to use it later on, so again convert it to a format similar to this. That's what this line is doing. Okay. So once you have that, then you'll return the encoded input, uh, which is your output of this LSTM. And uh, final state is basically the state that I asked you to say that we'll use later on. So this encoded input is basically your intermediate representation that I was talking about before. And now we can forget about and that we ever saw of C. Yeah. And uh, this uh, representation is all we have. Okay. Let's see, am I missing anything here? Nope, all good. Okay. So before we talk about attention, let's uh, talk about, uh, uh, no, okay. Let's talk about attention, then we'll talk about decoder. So like I said, once we have this intermediate representation, we'll use this and an attention vector, which basically tells that in the original, uh, character sequence C, which letters are important to the current timestamp. That's what the output of this attention class will be. And then we'll use both those vectors, the intermediate representation and this attention vector together in the decoder. Okay. So uh, let's talk about attention now. So the, uh, the kind of attention we'll be implementing here is dot product attention, which is uh, what you are encouraged to use in your homework for as well. Uh, unless you, uh, you want to try with other uh, techniques which you are encouraged to. And uh, okay, let's see what's happening here. So basically for every time step. So now what you will do is once you have the intermediate representation, you'll run a for loop and uh, you'll keep on making predictions for the output phonemes. And suppose you are at the ith, as you have already uh, predicted i minus one phonemes and now you are about to predict the ith phoneme. So that's when you'll call this forward function. This query represents your 
uh, decoder state at a single timestamp at that ith timestamp timestamp uh, and uh, uh, this context is basically your uh, uh, output of your encoder which is the intermediate representation and uh, let's see uh, lens is basically the uh, lens of the source sequences and this will be this will basically return the attention vector and the attention attended source context so uh, let me try to tell you what's going on here before i jump into the code so basically let's say this is your output of your encoder some vector right and then you have a query at some timestamp so remember this timestamp is different from this uh, this timestamp this is just your uh, encoded vector and now that c timestamp is not important like the number of letters in c basically so now you are just making uh, output predictions uh, as many as you want that's up to you okay so for a given timestamp of the decoder we will see how similar it is to each of the elements in the attention uh, in the uh, context vector context vector is your intermediate representation so you'll try to find similarity scores with each of them by doing dot product so dot product is just one kind of similarity you could have used some other kind of similarity that would lead to a different kind of attention yeah so you'll basically see how uh, how similar this query is to each of the elements in the context and once you have some scores let's say this is like 0.1 this is like 0.2 and suppose uh, you have some 0.8 here right what that means is this query is extremely similar to this word so if the original word was let's say uh, like i can't say c anymore this is like i made like six let's say i don't know like elephant or something something bigger then uh, whatever is here let's say p so p has a greater weightage uh, towards this uh, decoder time stamp okay so once you have this similarity scores then you will uh, do a weighted sum of all the values using this similarity scores and finally just get one one value which uh, one uh, value which denotes the entire uh, attention uh, like attended vector basically so you have already applied attention and uh, now you have that information that okay i want to give priority to this uh, letter in the input okay now let's see that in code so uh, you might see some new functions here but uh, don't worry they are very simple uh, first thing let's 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 uh, define what bmm does let's tell you that so basically if you have uh, it's a simple operation suppose uh, you have a matrix of bad size and let's say 3 comma 2 a tensor of bad size 3 comma 2 and you have another tensor bad size of let's call this 13 comma 2 and uh, let's uh, you have another one which is 2 comma 5 so if you do bmm it will basically think of it this way that's how i think about it ignore bad size and just do matrix multiplication of 13 2 and 2 5 so basically you will get 13 comma 5 so th this two will go away so this is what a nn dot bmm does okay so uh, first thing you want to do is like i said you want to multiply the query with the context vector to get similarity scores this multiplication to get this point 1 point 2 point 8 this is what's happening in this line so your context is what your context is of size uh where are you your context is of size uh this this is your context size and this is your query size so like i said batch size is common and max len comma hidden size and hidden size comma 1 will con will get converted to max line max len comma 1 this hidden size will go away so as you can see this is the same as the example i showed you also if you guys have any doubts or if i'm not explaining anything well please feel free to interrupt me okay so uh once you do this bmm you have the similarity scores in the attention vectors what is this unsqueeze and squeeze doing by the way it's just inserting extra dimension so you are able to multiply so you can't do bmm if uh, this is just like bad size comma 5 so if this is the case you'll insert a one here assuming there's a one here uh yeah suppose these were your two vectors so you will insert a one here 
just so you can do the BMM. So that's what you're doing here. Your query was actually batch size comma hidden size, but you converted to converted it to batch size comma hidden size comma one. You inserted a dimension at the in at index two. Then you did the BMM and then you remove that dimension again so that uh, it becomes batch size comma max len again. So that's basically your attention vector. Attention vector is nothing but similarity scores. So once you have those similarity scores, the next thing you'll do is make a mask out of it. So uh, remember we did lots of padding. So there are lots of uh, useless tokens there, which we don't want to include. So that's why we pass the lens here. We'll take the original lens and we'll compare it with the uh, max lens basically. And then we'll try to create this mask basically, which will be true for all the positions where the length ends. So if the max length is let's say eight and uh, there are variable lengths and one of the lengths is five. So for the remaining three, this mask will be true. And what we'll do is in this attention vector, then we'll, for these true values, we'll fill negative infinity because we want to ignore them. Finally, we'll take a soft max. So this soft max is basically, you have all the similarity scores, right? but they need to sum to one because you need to take a weighted combination. And uh, so that's why you apply softmax. Otherwise this, the sum could be more than one, right? So you apply that across dimension one, which is, which is your length dimension. Yeah, this that's pretty straightforward. And once you have that, then, okay. Now you just, all you have is similarity scores that are, uh, that are that sum to one basically. Now you want to get the weighted vector, like I said, 0.1 into this, plus 0.2 into this and so on. So for that, you will again do BMM of this attention final vector and the original context, which will be your output of this uh, power layer. And again, as you can see, this attention was batch size comma max length, but this time we inserted a dimension in the middle of it using unsqueeze one. So it became batch size comma one comma max length and your context is batch size comma max length comma hidden size. And then you'll uh, get batch size comma one comma hidden size. This max len will go away. Okay. Uh, I hope that was clear. So once you have this attention, now what do you have basically? All you have after this are two vectors. The first vector was your intermediate representation, the context itself. And the second is this attended context vector, which I think I've told five times now, like five times now that uh, is uh, representing which words are important in the original input. Okay, now let's quickly talk about decoder. Now we'll use this both, uh, these two vectors to start generating or making predictions. So our decoder will basically again consist of an embedding layer. Why do we have this again? Because remember uh, in the decoder part, you're dealing with phonemes. You're not dealing with the letters anymore. So the embedding layer for phonemes will be different. And uh, again, uh, the vocab size of phonemes will be different. And what, what would that be, by the way? That would just be the length of this array. That's the vocab size of phonemes. And the length of letters, uh, the vocab size of letters was the length of this array. Anyways, so you have an embedding layer in decoder. And uh, okay, one important thing here is now you'll be using LSTM cell instead of LSTM. So remember, what does LSTM do? You pass it the entire input tensor, which is your batch size cross max length, or actually max length co comma batch size but it will just make a prediction for the entire length of the input vector. But we don't want to do that. We are trying to make prediction time step by time step here. So for every time step, we'll make a prediction, then we'll store its uh, state and the output, and then we'll uh, use the stored state to predict them to make the next prediction and so on. So we don't want to uh, finish it off for the entire length in one go. We want to deal with the time step by time step. That's why we're using LSTM cell. What else? Uh, this attention is our own defined class, nothing special here, uh, which we've already talked about before. And then we just have a linear layer because uh, why are we doing all this? To make predictions. Finally, we want to output a probability distribution over all these phonemes and we'll pick the max one. We'll say, okay, the maximum likely phoneme is N. So our prediction is N like that. So that's what the linear layer is for. What else? Uh, okay, so in decoder, then you have your uh, embedding. Uh, first, you pass your input through the uh, embedding layer. And uh, once you have that, then you pass it through the uh, LSTM cell. And remember, this state initially will be the state that we stored in the encoder. So remember, I told you we're saving the state, the state will use it later. So this is where we'll use it. 
and uh, once you have uh, this output so remember the output is uh, consists of two elements the first one is the output the second one is another two tuple of two elements so in this case we just want the output uh yeah but we will also return the new state because remember uh, we are dealing step time step by time step so we can't lose the state information so we'll return the new state vector as well which will keep on passing again and again uh, to, to this forward function and uh, once you have the output then you will apply attention on top of it so like i said you have your uh, uh, input you have your context which is the output of your encoder and uh, uh, these are context lens basically and then you'll apply attention on top of it and these are the two values you'll get uh, one is your x attention which is the attended vector and this attention is just a vector for visualization purposes that's not being used uh, in this uh, training so as you can see we were also returning the attention vector so we'll try to visualize that later on which will be helpful for your debugging in homework four and uh, they they basically just uh, contain similarity scores or uh, how the output uh, phonemes map to the input phonemes uh, yeah the correspondence basically anyways so once you have your attention and uh, uh, the attended vector and this is where all the magic is happening so instead of just passing x now you are also passing the attended vector along with x so this is like why attention based model gets really high results because you're passing this extra information so now while making the prediction it knows that okay i need to focus a lot on some particular words you concatenate it and then you pass it through the output layer uh, which will take hidden size into 2 as it should uh, because uh, now you have uh, x is also hidden size i think yeah the output of lstm cell is hidden size and then you've concatenated x attention which is also hidden size and length so twice of hidden size and you'll just output a probability distribution over vocab size okay so this is your decoder uh so finally putting it all together you have your encoder you have your attention calculation then you have your decoder and decoder will output the probabilities that you that is all you ever wanted okay so let's talk about the training now so uh yeah we'll just initialize encoder and decoder uh, with the, this is like the vocab size some embedding size in this toy example and some uh, hidden sizes and uh, yeah one thing that's important here is uh, the cross entropy loss the type of reduction is sum so the default values actually mean but the reason we are doing sum is uh, uh think of it this way so there are some real tokens in the matrix uh, and there are some padded values so like the matrix i'm talking about is this one so some there are some real tokens this one and there are some padded tokens like this which are sort of useless so uh, while calculating the loss we don't want to count these tokens so if we just leave it default then it will try to calculate mean over the whole thing and it will take the length of the whole thing uh, which is something we don't want so we'll just take the sum of the real tokens losses and then we'll divide it by the number of real tokens so that's why we're doing reduction equal to sum and then uh, yeah in the adam optimizer we want to specify both the encoder parameters and decoder parameters some learning rate and uh, what else uh, you have your uh, okay so now uh, uh, notice that this toy example code is not using any data loader so we'll just iterate through our data set uh, which we define which we defined in the pre processing so we'll pass the x uh, through the encoder and uh, we'll get some this is the intermediate representation that i keep talking about and this is the state that we are storing as output of the encoder that we'll use in the decoder okay now notice that this encoder is uh, using the, the format of the shape that it's using is uh, maxlen comma batch size the batch size is the second dimension because it was dealing with lstms but in the attention vector we are using uh, batch size first so even uh, i said in this example batch size is first so for both your attention and your decoder batch size is first so all we do is we transpose both the context and the state Uh, uh vectors uh, tensors and uh, uh we provided detailed comments here so that you know like how the shapes are uh, changing anyways so batch size now becomes first and now we are also uh, finding the number of real tokens because uh, we don't want to include uh, uh this slashes basically because as, as you'll see like uh, we won't be uh, uh will uh, set them to mask them to false in the in this following loop 
and uh, this is the number of tokens that you'll actually be dividing your loss with which you will calculate using some like as a okay so uh, for i in range y size minus 1 so this is basically your uh, uh, the, you now you are iterating over this matrix and uh, i basically ranges from 0 to 3 uh, 0 to 2 actually you are doing minus 1 and uh, uh, so for each time step you will pass on the entire batch and you will make the prediction for each of them uh okay there are some slight nuances that i should miss you can look into it on your own in the interest of time but uh, the point is okay so you pass your yi which is your entire uh, you know uh, like vector uh, vector of size 12 basically tensor of size 12 12 is your batch size you pass it to the decoder you make the prediction you get the output you get the state and you get the attention vector which will be used just for visualizations and remember this state is the how the uh, lstm cell state since we are iterating time step by time step we need to pass it uh in the next iteration which is what we are doing here as you can see this variable name is same as this variable so it's going in again and again and then you just have an all attentions where you'll uh, append the attention uh, again for visualization purposes and then you are trying to get the uh, mask of sequences that have been tended basically so what could happen is uh, in this matrix like i said you have a uh, variable length sequences so it could be that predictions of some of them have ended so if you are at this i you want to discard uh, you want to discard this sequence this sequence and you only want to make predictions for these uh, sequences so that's what you determine using this mask and uh, then you apply that mask on the output and the uh, expected uh, values uh, and then you find the loss and then you divide it and this is just a uh, pretty standard stuff as you did, did before okay so now your training is done and uh, your uh, loss is calculated now uh, first of all how will we use it uh, before we get into visualization let me show you how will we actually use it to uh, predict make some predictions so it's this is like a greedy based de uh, greedy decoding uh, algorithm that we have implemented here uh, we would recommend you to maybe start with this in homework 4 and then uh, if you want maybe you can also experiment with peep search uh, but basically uh, you have some test data you again process it like i processed uh, the training data exact same way and then you just go through it and you pass it through the encoder you get the context you transport bo transpose both the context and the state then you uh, yeah you get the initial input token uh, slashes which is like how you want to start picking the predictions this is the input you will give initially this will basically be appended with your attention context in time step 0 to make the prediction and uh, yeah you, that's pretty straight forward so then you just go through the decoder same as training and then uh, whatever uh, outputs you get you will just take r max uh, like since this is greedy algorithm you just pick the one with the maximum probability and uh, yeah you'll just keep on uh, appending whatever prediction you've made to the c sequence variable and uh, you'll keep on changing the input token uh, based on your uh, previous prediction so one important thing to notice here is that uh, we need to terminate th this because it could be like first condition is okay whenever you see slashes terminated but what if your model is not trained well uh, for example this model is not trained that well like this is just a toy example so it will just keep running infinite infinitely so you might want to place a constraint on the maximum number of predictions you want to make so i think yeah you'll need to do this as well in your homework four okay uh i've covered everything except visualization so remember we kept on appending uh, those attention vectors we said we'll use later for visualization what are those vectors basically uh these similarity scores so uh and uh, these similarity scores for each decoder time step so like at the next time step a uh, time step there will be another box and that will have its own similarity scores and so on so we have all these attention vectors so we'll uh, we use them to uh, to make this visualization and then you can see how uh, these output phoneme labels how well they are corresponding with the input phoneme labels so these actually don't make sense uh, because this is just a raw example but in your homework four you should be able to see clear diagonals uh, because uh, 
because approximately, as you can see here, like S corresponds to this S and this E, E corresponds to this I, Y. So it should be a diagonal. It's not like this S corresponds to this T, right? So, yeah, yeah, I think, I think I, that's everything. So now we have five minutes remaining. Let's, let's discuss any questions you guys have. From me or Jingwei. Um, I have a quick question about the input. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like what you're doing is um, just taking in the letters. Do we need to, um, words, also include a start and end tag for oh, yeah. the input? Uh, so we're doing that for phonemes in this line, as you can see here. Yeah, of, uh, I'm or, asking for the X. Or X, that's a good question. Let me see. Or gen, like, I, I, it seems like you're not doing that, but would that possibly gen help the process? So basically we just uh, want to get a intermediate representation for X. We're not making any predictions, right? So uh, the input and output symbols are important when you're making predictions. You wanna know where to end and when you've started. So you just, you have this X and you're just trying to get another representation of it. So I don't think that's needed, no. Uh, I, but I would still advise you to uh, double check what's written in homework for write up. But my guess would be that that shouldn't be included. Uh, because I, I don't think that's going to help your case. Yeah. Um, will we have access to the Jupyter Notebook? I saw the slides uploaded on the website. Yes, I will upload this uh, upload it after this session. Thank you. And this is also really detailed. Thank you both. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, can I can I see the pack padded sequence again? There you go. Okay, so what's happening here? If I under, I just want to make sure I understand correctly. What's happening is that um, you're t getting rid of the paddings, right? Because the zero is technically mapped to E's or something like that. Is that correct? Yes. Or, and yes. then be padded again with the pad pack sequence. Yes. Okay. Cool. Because the zero, I was I was wondering before it happened that the zeros did did map to some letter and I was confused. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how we'll avoid that confusion. That's a good question. Yeah. So yeah. as you can see, zero is actually, uh, it has a meaning here, zero is E. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so that's how we'll avoid it. That's why we maintain this real lens everywhere. And uh, throughout this code, uh, I encourage you to read it again. You'll see that we've always kept track of the real lens and anytime we are doing an operation, uh, which might, you know, uh, get ruined because of this padding, we're making sure that we uh, just don't use that part and only the real lens part. Okay. Also, I just want to uh, mention it quickly that uh, the value of batch first parameter in this uh, function is false by default, which is what's happening here. Uh, but I think, yeah, in the previous homework, you had to set it to true because you were dealing with CTC loss and it had a requirement that your batch first must be true. So uh, that's basically up to you, right? Like you can just control that, but it, you don't need to do that. Uh, because since you are passing max length comma batch size, if you if you if you set batch first equal to true, then you need to uh, pass max, batch length comma max length. That's one point. Another point is uh, remember to set enforce sorted uh, enforce sorted as false. So this basically uh, says that your lengths do not need to be sorted, and uh, that's that's what we want. We are never sorting our lengths, right? We just got the lengths. But if you this value is true by default, if you don't set it, then it will expect this to be true and uh, yeah, uh, all sorts of problems will happen. Okay, any, any other question? Okay, so let's close for the day. And uh, if you guys have any additional questions, just feel free to post on Piazza or come to office hours. Thanks everyone. Yes, thanks everyone. Thank you so much.